Let's say this out loud together. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am what God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by His word. Christ is my master. And to Him, I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of my sermon this morning is House Cleaning. You know, from time to time, I know many of us clean our homes or have our homes cleaned almost every day. Maybe you clean it yourself. You have some maids come and they clean it for you. And uh, you kind of clean, do that cleaning that goes on almost every day. But I think many of us, uh, there are times in the year, especially maybe during Diwali holidays, Christmas holidays, New Year holidays, or maybe summer break, when you decide that you're really going to go into those parts of your home that you never venture into, right? You're going to open those cupboards that you normally don't open up, and you're going to look in all those closets where you've been collecting things for a long time, and then you open those cupboards and say, man, where did this come from? Who put it in here? You know, why do I need this? I don't know if you're like me. I like to get rid of things. I don't like to collect things. Right? There's some people who like to collect lots and lots and lots of things. I usually just get rid of them. Don't, I'm not using it. Out. And then you got to open up. And so there are those times in the year, hopefully, where you really clean up your home. You really get into those little corners where the maids don't normally go. And you clean all this up and get all the garbage and you throw it out. And uh, then you feel really good that you've done some house cleaning. You're ready for the new year. Uh, so we're going to do something like that this morning. We're going to do some house cleaning. <laughs> all right. And we're going to begin, first of all, with our house, the local church. The local church is the house of God. And, and we need to keep the house clean. Amen. You know, we need to keep our local church clean. Now, it's important to have the floor clean, the chair, chairs clean, so we can all sit and be happy during the service. But I think uh, there's a greater dimension to the house of God than just the physical place in which we meet. The house of God is you and me as people of God. And we need to keep us, the local church, clean. And uh, so I want to address that first as we talk about house cleaning this morning. Paul warned about this phenomenon that would take place in the last days. If you have your Bible, please turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Paul writes this. He says this about the last days. He says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So he says, you know, in the last days, this is going to happen. Now the last days began on the day of Pentecost. And we are in the end of the last days. We're the the latter part of the last days. And Paul says, uh, the Holy Spirit is speaking this with such uh, seriousness, with such urgency, that in the last days, people, believers will depart from the faith, will go away from the faith, giving heed or listening to, paying close attention to, what he calls as deceiving, or the King James says, seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. So this is a warning for the house of God, for people of God. Say, guys, listen, in the last days, you've got to watch out for this thing. There will be an assignment against the church, against the house of God, against the people of God, By deceiving, seducing spirits and demons that are very interested in church. So like, I thought devils don't like church. They do. Because that's where they find a lot of godly people who can influence the world. But if they can get these, weaken these people, neutralize these people, then they're actually weakening the influence of the church on the world. So he says, in the last days, you will have this phenomena happening. They will be seducing spirits, targeting the church. There will be 
doctrines of demons, demonically energized teachings that begin to come into the church. And he gives some sort of a list, and this is not a complete list, of the kinds of things that will be promoted in the last days. But this is just a representative list. He says in verse 2, they will speak lies in hypocrisy. They will have their own conscience seared with hot iron. They will forbid to marry all the young men say amen. They will forbid to marry. They will command to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. But those who believe and know the truth... For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. This is just a representative list of the kinds of things that will, be, that will be promoted by these seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. I mean, they will come, come up with all kinds of things, that, you know, strange things that you shouldn't marry or you shouldn't eat this and you shouldn't eat that. And they will speak lies and hypocrisy and uh, their conscience will be seared with heart. They will have no conscience. They will speak whatever they want. But this kind of things will happen in the church. And what we're reading here is not an exhaustive list of the kinds of things that will come into the come against the church. It's a representative list. Are you all with me so far? Right? So these are the kinds of things that will happen. So uh, as a church, we must be on guard, not allow these kinds of things infiltrate us as a local body, as a house of God. Now, let's, let's see an example of this um, that took place back uh, in the church at Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2. So here's an example of how these seducing spirits and doctrines of demons begin to come into a local church. If you turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, we'll read verses 18 onwards through to 29. Here's an example of how a local church began to experience the influx of seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And Jesus is speaking to this church in Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2 verse 18. He says, to the angel of the church in Thyatira write... These things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire. So his eyes are like flame of fire. They penetrate. They go in. They see things that are deep. Whose feet are like fine brass. Brass stands for judgment. That he will judge anything that's against uh, his ways. He says in verse 19. I know your works, love, your service, your faith, and your patience or your endurance. As for your works... The last are more than the first. I mean, saying like, you're a great church. You've got lots of ministries going on. In fact, the number of ministries that you have right now are a whole lot more than what what you began with. And I know your faith. You've got great faith. I know your love. You're a people of love. I know your endurance. You're a great bunch of people. You've got all kinds of things going good for you. But, verse 20, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. So she's got a spiritual garment on. She's got reputation of a minister of God. She calls herself a prophetess. What does she do? She, to teach and seduce my servants, my people. She teaches and seduces them. That means she's got teaching that seduces. The word seduce simply means to go into error. So here is a woman energized by a demonic spirit that we will call a spirit of Jezebel. Now, demon spirits are gender neutral. Okay, so in this particular case, it was a woman. But it doesn't always have to be a woman. It could be a man. It could be anyone that the devil wants that's just working through, right? But he's saying, yeah, there's something, there's something happening. There, uh, through someone, the spirit of Jezebel has gained access into your local congregation and is doing this. It is through teaching. Seducing. That means there is things that are being taught and that are seducing, causing my servants to go into error. What kind of error is that exactly? He says, they're teaching my servants, seducing my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. So he has eyes as a flaming fire that penetrates right into the hearts and minds of people. He sees, he examines what's going on there, and he says, I will give to each one according to your works. 
Now to you I say and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine. So there are certain people who refuse to embrace this kind of teaching that seduces, that causes people to go into error. They have refused them who have not known the depths of Satan. So that teaching is actually the depths of Satan, is what Jesus Christ is saying. He says, to these people, I, will have, I have nothing else against you. I mean, you're clear. You're in the clear. Those of you who refuse the doctrine, this kind of teaching, you're in the clear. I don't have any problems with you. That's what he's saying. But, verse 25, but hold fast to what you do have till I come. And he who overcomes, so this is very important, for us to overcome the spirit of Jezebel, the kind of spirit that influx into the local church. He says, but he who overcomes and keeps my work until the end, I will give power over the nations. We want to be a church that will be a voice to our nation and to the nations. This is key. It's important for us to stand guard against this kind of spirit, the spirit of Jezebel. If we are going to have authority over the nations, he says, I will give you power over the nations. Ye shall rule them with the rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel, as I have received from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has a ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. What's the meaning of this whole passage? There was a local church and there was a church in Thyatira. They were doing really good. There were all kinds of ministries going on. They were strong in their faith, great people with great endurance, great love, wonderful people. But there was something wrong in that church. What happened? Through a particular woman in this case. So let's not get very focused on the individual. But look at the spiritual dimension of what's going on. The spirit of Jezebel, which is a seducing spirit, gained entrance into the church. Seduce means to go into error. This spirit targeted two areas. The area of morality uh, or your affections and the area of your worship. Now, what is spoken of is not a literal, immo physical, natural immorality. But it's, uh, you have to understand that the spiritual realm, that the church, the people in the church who are affected by the spirit, spiritual, we were, spiritually were committing sexual immorality and idolatry. What is spiritual immorality? Spiritual immorality is misplaced affections. Instead of your affection being for Jesus Christ, your affection is now diverted to something else. That is spiritual immorality. You find that throughout the Old Testament. What is idolatry? Idolatry is misplaced worship or misplaced submission. You are submitting to the wrong thing. You are worshiping the wrong thing. And so worshiping the true and living God, we have now replaced worship to the true and living God by something else. That is idolatry. Are you with me so far? So what does the seducing spirit do? It targets two realms in our lives. It targets our affections. It targets our worship and our submission. And it comes, how does it come through? It comes primarily through teaching seducing doctrine. It comes in the garb of being a minister of God. It comes in the garb of bringing in something that is good. But Jesus says, it's actually the depths of Satan that is being presented to you. It's targeting your affections and it's targeting your worship and your submission. You've got to guard against this. Amen? And today in the church worldwide, there is so much of pull, uh, of infiltration, of of. of Doctrines of demons, of, of, of all kinds of things that come in the name of spirituality that draws our affection away from Jesus Christ. Where are our affections today? It's house cleaning time. Let's check out. Are your affections really on Jesus? Or is it on some style of worship? Your soul engrossed with some style of worship. This is the way worship has to happen. You're more affectionate towards that form of worship than the one who's being worshipped. Are your affections for Jesus or is it misplaced somewhere? Question that we need to ask. What about our worship? What are our submission? Whom are you submitting to? Are you submitting to Jesus Christ? Or are you submitting to some man? Some religious organization? Some form of doctrine that is moving you away from worshipping Jesus Christ? Where is your worship? Whom are you really submitting to? Amen? House cleaning time. Jesus said, this church is really going well, but there's some problem here. Now, the spirit of Jezebel actually 
uh, the name Jezebel actually goes back to the Old Testament in the book of 1st Kings and also some part in 2nd Kings. You will recall the history of Israel. During that time, there was a man, king named Ahab. King Ahab married a woman named Jezebel. She was not a Jewish woman. She came, I think, from, uh, uh, from a Phoenician background. She, he married another, a woman from another nation, brought her into Israel. Jezebel was her name. Now she brought, when she came into Israel, she brought along all her uh, gods that she worshipped. And she was so powerfully influential in the land. Ahab, the king, was a puppet in her hand. And through him, she spread witchcraft all across the land of Israel. Israel was at its peak of wickedness and idolatry and, oh, and uh, straying away from God when Jezebel was queen. Instead of encouraging the prophets of God, she encouraged the 400 eunuchs who were puppets in her hand. They were prophets of Baal. They came and sat at the king's table and they, she took care of them instead of taking care of the prophets of the true prophets of the living God. She spread witchcraft throughout the land. And, and, and Israel was in a big mess at the time of Jezebel. So God in the new, Jesus in the New Testament is using her name to refer to what this evil influence that will come into the church would do. That this demonic assignment against a local church would bring that same going a spiritual, going astray as happened in Israel to the people of God. If you're not careful, and to stand guard against the Spirit. Amen? That people will have misplaced affections and misplaced worship because of this assignment against the church. House cleaning time. Let's open up the cupboards. Check carefully. Where is your affection? Is it really for Jesus or is it for something else? Where is your submission? Where is your worship? Is it really for Jesus or is it for something else? The second assignment against the local church is, again, it, these are demonic assignments against the local church that we, that we must guard against in our day. Uh, part of what Paul said was there will they'll be seducing spirits or deceiving spirits and then there will be doctrines of demons. That means there are religious spirits. They come against a church in the last days. He mentioned two kinds, right? Seducing spirits. We saw the example here. And then he said doctrines of demons. They're religious spirits. They want to come against the church in the last days. So what are religious spirits? We see them exemplified in the lives of the Pharisees. Now these Pharisees during Jesus' time, they were very religious people, great scholars, they studied the law and they extrapolated the law into their own understanding and had their own set of regulations. I mean, they added law to the law. And they just had all this going for them. They were so engrossed in it and steeped in religion that when the truth came, they couldn't recognize the truth. So that's what religious spirits do. Religious spirits are characterized by at least three things. First, there is self-deception. They think they know the truth, but they don't recognize the truth when it's given to them. In John chapter 7, you see an interesting passage. In John chapter 7, verses 40 to 49. John chapter 7, verses 40 to 49. Therefore many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, Truly this is the prophet. See, Jesus was preaching in the temple. People heard Jesus and they said, Wow, this is truly a prophet of God. Verse 41, others said, this is the Christ. I mean, this is the Messiah. But some said, will the Messiah come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Now some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees. Who said to them, why have you not brought him? So the chief priests and Pharisees had sent some soldiers, officers to go and apprehend Jesus. So they went to do that, but then they came back without Jesus. And so the chief priests and Pharisees asking, why have you not brought him? That's verse 45, verse 46. The officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered them, are you also deceived? 
have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? So here come these soldiers, the officers who have come to catch Jesus. And Jesus is preaching in the temple. And they are floored. They say, wow, this is truth emanating from him. This is the word of God. He is a true prophet of God. As if we can't arrest a man like this. And then they go back to the Pharisees and chief priests and say, where is Jesus? Why haven't you brought him? They say, I'm sorry. You never heard anyone speak like this man. Never a man spoke like this. Meaning, something in them is awakening to the truth. Something in these officers, something in these soldiers is beginning to say, that man is the truth. But how do the Pharisees respond? Are you also deceived? I mean, look at us. Which amongst us Pharisees have ever recognized him as the truth? In other words, the religious spirit calls the truth a lie. That's what it did in those days. It does the same thing today. It looks at the truth and says, it's a lie. The fear of deception that keeps you from embracing the truth is a big deception in itself. Right? And how much of the church, in the fear of deception are actually rejecting the truth. Thinking that they are well protected when actually they are self-deceived. The truth is staring them in the face and they call it a lie. So that's what the religious spirit does. Another thing the religious spirit does as exemplified in the lives of these people, we see is it is hypocritical in the sense that it points out the speck in the brother's eye. While well, it ignores the plank in their own eye. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus put it this way. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 to 5. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not consider the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. The religious spirit is very quick to find a, to point out the minuscule faults in the others when it ignores or condones the huge gaping flaw in their own selves. Hypocrisy is to judge others while condoning yourself for the same or greater sin. And this is what the religious spirit promotes. A third thing the religious spirit promotes is man-pleasing. Live to please man. Live for the applause of man. So long as people say you're doing good, that's enough. And Jesus pointed out this flaw in John chapter 5 verse 44 when he spoke to the same Jewish people. In John chapter 5 and verse 44, he said, How can you believe who receive honor from one another? I mean, you scratch each other's back. You, feel, you make each other feel good. How can you believe and you receive honor from one another and you do not seek the honor that comes from the only God. See, the religious spirit is contented, content with having the approval of man and not seeking the accolade of God. As long as others in the church say, I'm doing fine, that means I'm fine. But you, that's not necessarily true. What about the Lord? Is He saying, you're fine? The religious spirit is more interested in the ratings of people than in the approval of heaven. Question mark this morning for us as a local church, as we as a people, as a house of God, question mark, have we given access or place to the religious spirit in our lives as a, as a body, as a church? Are we hesitant to embrace the truth, calling it a lie? Are we hypocritical? Are we more quick to point out the flaws in other people while ignoring the flaws in our own lives? Are we more interested in the applause of people than in the praise of God? Amen? The next part of the house cleaning, after we clean the house, the local church, is we need to clean our homes. Amen? We need to clean up our homes, our families. 
Let's go with, go, go with me please to Genesis the 18th chapter and the 19th verse. And I'm going to take a few moments to speak to husbands here. Genesis chapter 18 verse 19. The Lord speaks to, speaks about Abraham in Genesis 18, 19. And he says, for I have known him, that is I have known Abraham, in order that he may command his children and his household after him. That they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. That the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. God is saying, the reason I picked Abraham, I have known him. I picked him. Why? Because I want him to command his children, his family after him in the ways of the Lord. In righteousness and justice. So husbands... We have a mandate on our lives, a God-given responsibility on our lives. Now, you young men, if you're not married, don't say, hallelujah, I'm free. No. Better listen. Take close notes, right? Until you're going to be married, you'll come into this responsibility. Husbands, we have a God-given responsibility to lead our homes in the ways of the Lord. It falls upon us to guide our children and our household in the way of the Lord. And for us, it is so easy as we get so caught up in the everyday affairs of life and taking care of the home, financial needs and this need, that need, that we actually fail in this very area of our lives. Of being the spiritual leaders, if you will, of our homes. Of guiding our families in the way of the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, you kind of whack them all, give them Sunday school <laughs> and... I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying being a spiritual leader in your home. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, a very controversial passage. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to read verses 1 through 16. We will not spend too much time on the controversy, although I'll make some comments on it. But I want us to look at the spiritual part of what Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 16. Paul says here, verse 1, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. So he's commending the Corinthians. He's saying, you know, you guys are following my traditions, things that I've told you very carefully. Now, traditions very often are localized. That means they are for a given group of people. The traditions that we have as uh, people in Bangalore may not be the same as traditions that is practiced in Tamil Nadu. or So traditions often are very localized. So Paul is you know, kind of talking about certain traditions that are very localized to the Corinthian church. But in that process, I want you to see the spiritual dimension of what he's saying. He says in verse 3, But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God. So uh, he is talking about God's authority structure. And he's saying the head of the woman is the man. The head of the man is Christ. Now as we'll read on, you'll find that the context is about husband and wife. All right? So the head of the wife is the husband. The head of the husband is Christ. So husbands... We cannot expect our wives to walk in submission to us if we are not, first of all, walking in submission to Christ. Amen? Because the head of the husband is Christ. Just as the head of the woman, the wife, is the husband. So husbands, we must first walk in submission to Christ. And if we are walking in submission to Christ, then you can expect your wife. To walk in submission to you. That's the way authority flows. Verse 4. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. For that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. I'll explain. Verse 6. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if, it's shameful, but if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. 
For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in other words, okay, having said all that, Neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. In other words, like no one's better than the other. Relax, guys. Relax, ladies. I guess you read all the other words. Hey, how can he say man is better than the woman? No, no, relax. relax, relax. Nevertheless, to sum it up, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman. But all things are from God. So both man and woman have come from God. Happy? <laughs> Verse 13. Judge among yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with the head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him? Guys, with long hair, relax. I'll bring some redemption for you. <laughs> but if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given to her for a covering. Having said all that, here's the conclusion, verse 16. But if anyone seems to be contentious, I mean, if you want to argue about this, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Now, Paul was addressing a tradition, localized situation in the, in the Corinthian church. In the Corinthian culture, the symbol that a woman was married was she covered her head. A head. In that culture at that time, many of the prostitutes had their head shaved. So now, some of these people have now come into the church. They've become believers. They're now part of all people's church. Amen? So now we're trying to address the issue because you've got Ladies, you've got shorn head. You've got ladies who are married. And, uh, you know, you've got all this mix up here in, our, in the church now. And you don't want anybody to look down on those who are saved, but who have come from a, a wrong kind of background. Don't look down on them. So what are you saying? It's okay, in the church, for this particular congregation, it's good that if you're married, you cover your head as a sign that you are You with me? So he's addressing a local problem, a local situation. Like, likewise, in the 14th chapter, he tells all the Corinthian women, keep quiet in church. Now, we cannot take what he said then and put it into the present day church. You know, it was, he was addressing specific problems in that church. Like covering the head and being quiet in church. They were noisy bunch, the ladies. So he had to write to them in 1 Corinthians 14. And I... And I would that the woman not speak too much in church if she has any questions to go home and ask your husband over lunch. Do that. But don't in church, psst, keep quiet. So he's addressing a local issue, a local problem. That's, that's what he's doing in this head covering. And then he sums it up saying, listen, if you want to debate about this, if you want to argue about this, I want to tell you plainly, we do not have any such custom, nor do the other churches. It's only for your church. You're with me, right? So guys with long hair, ladies without covering, doesn't matter. Okay? It's your choice. Because it is something he was addressing in the local church for the Corinthians. Now, that's the, that's the natural side of it. That's not what I want to emphasize on. What we want to emphasize on is the spiritual reality that Paul is bringing out in this passage. Mixed in with this addressing of should I cover my head or should I not cover my head? Should men have long hair or short hair? Mixed in with this thing that he's addressing the local problem, he's addressing the Corinthian church, is a spiritual truth that we must see. What does he say? He says, husbands, your head is Christ. And wives, your head is the husband. This is how authority flows. But if the husband cannot be in subjection to Christ... How can the wife be in subject to the husband? Because he begins this chapter by saying, imitate me as I imitate. Meaning he's setting the stage up. See, I'm going to get into some controversial things here. But here's how I'm starting. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. I am setting the example. I'm following Jesus so I can ask you to follow me. 
So husbands, you want to be the head? Same thing applies. The only way you can ask your wife to follow you is when you follow Christ. The next thing I want to bring out to us is this. That the husband has a responsibility for the wife. He brings us in verse 10. He says, for this reason, the wife, the woman, the wife, should ha- ought to have authority over her head because of the angels. Now, this authority. Covering is, you know, this piece of cloth on your head won't even protect you from the rain. So don't get hung up on whether you should cover your head or not. But that's not the big deal. What he's saying in verse 10, there's a spiritual dimension to it. Husband, you have a spiritual authority over your wife and uh, over your home. And you need to extend this authority over your home. Why? Because there are demonic forces that would like to come against your home. Amen? So husbands, and I'm speaking to husbands here this morning. We have to stand guard two ways. So walk, I as a husband had to walk in submission to Christ. Number two, Christ, I mean that means Christ has to be Lord over every area of my life. Secondly, husbands, there's a spiritual responsibility over your home. Spiritual covering, protection over your home, over your family that you need to extend. Amen? Now, you wives, you say, I don't have a husband, it's okay. He said, in the end, he says, we're all from God, so it's okay. Don't worry. Right? Both the man and the woman come from God. So, you have connection with the Lord, don't worry. But for those of us who are husbands, we have a responsibility. Spiritual responsibility. The question I want to ask us as we do some house cleaning this morning is, how are we doing in that area of life? As husbands. The last area of house cleaning is our own individual lives. So we began with the local church, the house of God. We talked about the home. And finally, we want to talk about the individual life. Is there house cleaning we need to do in our lives in, as individuals, personally? Are there habits, behaviors, sins that we've gathered along the way over the course of 2011, 2010? That are actually an hindrance to our walk with God. You know this familiar verse in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. The writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. He says, Since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with patience, with endurance, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So he says, get rid of the sin, the sin ensnares, it cripples us, it keeps us stagnant, it locks us down into a particular place in our walk with God. Sin ensnares. But not only does sin ensnare, he says, let us lay aside the weights. Weights are not things that may be wrong, but they're just burdensome. And many times in our lives, there are things that maybe may not be wrong. I mean, you can't say it's wrong, but nevertheless, it's a weight. It's burdening you down. It's putting you down. It's preventing you from your walk with God. And the writer of Hebrews says, let's put them aside. Let us lay aside every weight. Are there things in our lives which may may not be wrong? But nevertheless, they're a hindrance to our walk with God. Do we need to, this morning, lay aside those weights? If you have your Bibles, please turn to John chapter 3. Verses 19 to 21. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light. And does not come to the light. Lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth. Comes to the light. That his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Verse 21 again. He who does the truth comes to the light. That his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Question. Are there things that you and I are doing that we have to keep in the dark? Or... 
Are we living lives in such a way that we could say, you know, I'm 100% in the light. I have nothing to hide. Because Jesus says here, whoever is doing what is the truth, he's living in the light. Remember, truth sets you free. So the only place you're really free is when you're in the light. The only place you're totally liberated is when you're in the light. And you're not afraid to live in the light because everything you do, you're doing it in God. Amen? I have nothing to hide. Everything is in the lights. Because everything is being done in God. But the moment there are some things I need to keep in the dark, that means they're not done in truth. And they're not done in God. Amen? So as believers, we need to ask ourselves, do I have things that I need to keep in the dark? I'm not talking about yesterday. I'm talking about right now. What, what's going on in your life right now? I mean, do you have to delete your browsing history every time you close the, your browser? Because you don't want somebody else to know what you've been seeing. You've got to keep some stuff in the dark. I'm not saying if you delete your browsing history, you're coming into sin. <laughs> I need to clean it up. We all need to clean it up from time to time. And that's not the point. The point is... That if there are things that you need to hide, it may, to keep in the dark, it means they're not being done in truth, and they're not, they're not being done in God. Amen? What about your financial transactions? Can they all be brought to the light? Or are there some transactions you have to keep in the dark? Just, just have to keep that part in the dark. Or can, can we live lives where we're saying, Everything I do, everything I say, everything I do is out in the open. I'm not afraid to keep it in the open. Because all of it is done in truth and all of it is done in God. The only time I have things to hide in the dark is when things that are not done in truth and things that are not done in God. Amen? Question is, as believers, 1 John chapter 1 verse 7 says, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. I cannot keep my, some part of my life in darkness and try to have fellowship with the one who is in the light. I've got to be in the light. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. Amen? House cleaning time. Open up the cupboards. Bring everything to the light. If there are things that we're doing that needs to be kept in darkness, let's discard them. Let's come to a place where we say, look, I want to live a life where everything I do, I can do it in the light. Which means everything I do must be done in truth and must be done in God. Amen? Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, he said, judgment must begin in the house of God. For the time has come when judgment must begin in the house of God. So here we are. Let it begin with us. There's nothing, there's no condemnation against anybody who is in Christ Jesus. We've all got our flaws. We've all got our weaknesses. We've all made mistakes. So this morning is not to condemn us, but this morning is for us to come clean. To do some house cleaning. To go beyond the regular routine of, yes, yes, I've, I've asked the Lord, sorry for my sins. He's forgiven me. I'm going on. To go beyond the regular cleaning that we do every day and say, God, I want to open up the cupboards of my life. I want to open up every part of my life. And I want to reach out and take out things that should not be there. Clean me, Lord. I want to pray about what we've heard this morning. As a local church, we've got to guard ourselves against seducing spirits and religious spirits. The church in Thyatira, unfortunately, it is much as, as wonderful as they were, a church that had a lot of ministry going on, a lot of love and faith and great endurance, great determination. And as wonderful as they were, somehow unawares, 
their affections were being diverted. Their worship and their submission was being distracted. They were giving place to something else. I wonder if any one of us as a, as a people who belong to this house, if our affection is not on Jesus, it needs to be there. If our worship and our submission is not on Jesus, it needs to be there. The Pharisees who were great scholars, who were great intellectuals, who knew the law, they missed the truth. Because they were overpowered by religious spirits. They called the truth a lie. They couldn't recognize the truth. They were quick to point out the speck in their brother's eye. While ignoring the plank in their own. They sought one another's approval. Rather than the honor that came from God. Have we, as a church, as a people, as individuals, given room to such kind of things in our lives, in our walk with God? It's time this morning to clean up and say, come Lord, this is your house. Clean us, Lord. In your homes, husbands, Are you walking in submission to Christ so that the rest of your family can walk under your leadership? Is Christ really Lord of every area of your life? Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Can we as husbands tell our families, our homes, imitate me as I imitate Christ? Is every area of our lives truly under the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Is he Lord of all? And we as individuals, can we be a people who will walk in the light? That we have nothing to hide, nothing to keep secure under lock and key, so that nobody else can get into that room or that area of our lives. Is everything in the light? If not, let's make changes this morning as we just seek the Lord for a few moments. I believe He will release grace to us. I believe He will come and do a work in our hearts and our lives to clean us up. His love and His desire is for us as a people. He will do it. Father, we just ask that this morning you will do a cleansing, a purifying in our hearts, in our lives. We want to be the house of God, a holy house, a house that is filled with your presence, with your beauty, with your grace. You're the one who sits with eyes that are like a flaming fire that sees into the hearts and the minds of people beyond all that is hidden beyond all that is wailed so Lord this morning we ask that you will reach down deep in our hearts and our lives and Do a work of cleansing in us as a body and as individuals, oh God. We bring our affections back to you. We bring our worship and our submission to you alone, Lord Jesus. We renounce the influence of every religious spirit. We embrace the truth. We renounce hypocrisy. We renounce the accusing finger. And Lord, we renounce man pleasing and choose to receive the honor that comes from God above. Oh Lord, we pray that you would help 
every husband to be a spiritual leader in the house. To exert a spiritual influence in prayer and in, in living a godly life in the home. And Father, for each one we pray that we will be people who walk in the light. There will be no need for any dark corner in our lives. But that all our deeds will be done in truth. So that truly, God, we can say that all our deeds are done in God. Come, do this for us, Lord. Help us to be a people of the light. We'll walk in the light. Does anyone here this morning, you feel like, you know, all this sounds good. But I find myself this morning in a horrible mess. Is there any hope for me? Can God get me out? The psalmist said this in Psalm 40. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined his ear unto me. He brought me out of a horrible pit. He set my feet upon a rock. He established my goings. He put a new song in my mouth. Even praise to my God. And many will see it and be glad and put their trust in Him. There is no horrible pit. There is no horrible mess. No matter how deep you've fallen, no matter how low you've reached, no matter how dark it seems, no, how, no matter how lonely it feels, there is no place that you've fallen to where if you will wait patiently for the Lord, if you will look to Him, and he will not pull you out of and set your feet upon the rock. There is no horrible pit too, too deep for God, too dark for him. If you will reach out this morning and say, God, I need help. I need to get out of this horrible mess that I'm in. I don't know which area of your life it may be. It may be in your affections. It may be in your worship that you've gone astray. And it may be in your affections that you've gone astray. It may be in some of your habits that have gone astray. It doesn't matter what area of life that you find yourself in a horrible pit. There is a God in heaven who can bring you out. And he will set your feet upon the rock. He will make you going secure. He will give you a new song to sing. Would you pray? Would you pray? Would you ask him, Lord, I need some help this morning. I need you to help me, God. I need you to help me get out of this. I need you to bring me out of this. I want my life cleaned up. I want my house clean. I want my home clean. I want my church clean. Would you pray? Would you pray? Would you pray? Father, may each one of us leave this place this morning as people who have been changed. by your presence. May there be adjustments, alignments in our lives that bring us more into line with your will, your ways, your purposes, God. We just thank you. We bless you, God. Thank you for all that you do in our lives, that you change us from glory to glory. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We honor you. We praise you. Let's put our hands together for Jesus. Lord, we just thank you.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you do in our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, O oh God. We praise you and we honor you, God. We bless you. Amen. Let's get ready to close. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and lift up his countenance on you and give you his face. In Jesus' name. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.